Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I am most pleased to welcome you back to part two of a two-week series titled White Men as Full Diversity Partners. We have a very, very informed guest, and it was such a delight interviewing him last week. His name is Michael Welp, or Dr. Welp. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Iowa State University. He holds a master's degree in organization development from American University in Washington, D.C., and his doctorate degree in organizational development is from Filling Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, Dr. Welp, I just really enjoyed uh, your expertise and knowledge last week, and thank you for sharing so much time with us. Thank you, Tony. It was a pleasure. And as always, I'm pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and she will commence today's questioning. Welcome back to the program. Thanks. It's going to be fun today to discuss some of these subjects with you. Last week we talked a little bit about your background, and you've had some very interesting and unique experiences both in your life and in your work experience. Can you share with us some of your, your background and specifically about your time that you spent in South Africa, what it was like? Mm -hmm. It was a fascinating time for me. In, in the world, it was just six months after Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And so a lot was changing in South Africa. And I had the honor of facilitating intensive seven-day Outward Bound courses that were set up for interracial team building. A lot of mining companies uh, had folks who were working on the same shift come together to learn how to work together. And even though they uh, worked together for many years, they had never slept in the same room together. They never well, ate the same table. We're talking now about black men and white men. Right. Right, and, and what they would call coloreds as well, Indians and others. And, and so within 10 minutes of them getting off the bus, we'd have them crossing swamp sort of activities and ropes together where they had to be hands-on, which was really unheard of for them. And we just built on it the whole week. And I remember being struck by um, a, a white man saying, I feel like I've been betrayed by my com country. Told things that taught things that weren't true. So really, since they had never interacted, they never tested their assumptions about each other and realized and discovered, as one man said, I now see everybody as my brother and sister, that they all have the same hopes, they have the same fears. And so they really came together and discovered a lot of commonality. And that was a wonderful thing to watch. I got to partner with a black African instructor and we'd lead the whole process for the week and that was of course a wonderful partnership for me as well. And you learned something from that about how white men think about themselves. I did. Um, it was a, a remarkable sense of, of, you know, partly to be a white man is not to have to think about the white male part of you. And same as a woman, to be a white is not to have to think about it. And I don't really think about how that gives me a different view of the world. And so I realize this is not that different than what it is in America. People are often separated in America, too, and don't get a chance to test their assumptions about each other that they get out of the media and other different stories that they hear everywhere. I want to go back to play upon or, or build upon, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, the discussion last week. and. You articulated so clearly uh, the white men culture, at least in our society, and we talked about uh, the six tenets. And from that, I want to talk about uh, connecting between white women and white men, and then, uh, then all women and all men mm. of all colors. Uh, when you talked about, for example, that, that women tend to connect with one another, whereas men are more uh, dealing with status and, and their position. Now that with your work you're learning so much about the white men uh, culture as far as attitudes from different ones you talk to, isn't there another step? It might not even be in your lifetime, it's such a long process, mm -hmm. but the more that white men understand themselves, 
and white women understand how they are different and then all women of all colors and men of all colors is the day going to come hopefully that it, it, it's not that any particular segment of the society is doing away with their their particular aspect of their culture but learning to understand one another and communicate better let me just this mm -hmm. very involved question I was debating a uh, Mr. D'Souza's at Gonzaga University Law School some time ago and he wrote a book the end of racism and his contention was the way you end racism is for everyone to accept the dominant culture in this country, which obviously I disagreed with. Mm -hmm. That everybody brings their culture to the table and we're all richer by it. So my very involved question is, do you see that down the road or your work in that uh, when women and men often, if they understand one, their, their approach very well and understand the other one's approach, it can really change relationships. And I'm speaking particularly not only in the workplace but in families. I, I think I do believe what you're saying uh, Tony, it's that um, I don't want to see everybody assimilate to white male culture and uh, just as much I don't want to see all white men automatically assimilate as this is the only way to be, this is the only way to think because any culture has downsides and upsides and if we only have one culture as a solution then we're locked into um, things and, and, and that doesn't work all the time. So sometimes you know, with that low tolerance of uncertainty, we have to accept complexity. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, paradoxes, we talk about several different paradoxes and, and around diversity for white men, but one is sameness and difference. That I need to focus on our sameness and focus on our difference at the same time. In other words, with race, I need to be colorblind and color conscious at the same time. So I want to notice all our common humanity as we engage each other. And I want to notice in a meeting who's getting interrupted, whose voice gets heard from based on gender, based on race, and just notice that. And that's a deeper complexity than, um, I think, just having everybody assimilate to one simple set of rules. I guess also what I'm getting out of your discussion is that when you understand so much who you are and why you're that way, such as white men's culture, and if women understand very much how they are different. And then when they come together in some situation, not trying to determine that everyone's going to go to a particular approach, but that understanding, I would assume, that would cause a much greater tolerance, understanding, patience, and appreciation of those differences. Mm -hmm. I would like to see every all of us be more bicultural so okay. that I can be more of a male culture or white male culture. I can also lean into uh, female culture and own more of that part of me and uh, connect more to my own emotions and express them. And so instead of losing what you have, it's just adding to in many ways. Right. It's adding to my choice about what part of me I share and, and, and see in myself. It's giving me freedom to be exploring all of who I am. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, it means I can have deeper relationships with other white men because they're not limited to the confines of sports or weather or certain things or the status and rank. But I can have more deep connecting pieces of sharing my challenges in life and others in here. So there's more support and opportunity. It does open a lot of doors. And finally, I would say that as people understand and can, through that process, lower tension and, and frustration, that it can also have an impact health-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the life expectancy of, of men and of white men is shorter um, by seven years of women. And as women in the workplace assimilate more into white male culture, that's getting shorter for women. So um, one of the things I do when I work with white men over a long time is we get clear on what are the costs to us of the way things are now. Because a lot of people think it's all benefiting us. and you know, to play out a culture you don't even know you have, there's parts of it that cost you. You know, whether it's quality of relationships with other people or the, you know, your ability to tolerate confusion and ambiguity in the world. And so um, there's, uh, I have found in my work as a practitioner of diversity and it's led me to be healthier in my life. Thank you. Janelle Burke. 
I want to follow up on a little bit of what you were talking about. As a white woman, how do I learn to work with white men who are very much into the white male culture? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, we end up working a lot with white women in organizations is making sure you're not colluding and protecting that those white men from learning um, about themselves. And so actually, um, we've written several field guides. One of them is diversity tips for white men. Another one is diversity tips for white women and people of color on engaging white men. And so those are two of those books that um, really help you kind of question your assumptions around, and what's your learned history of how you typically engage white men. Um, there's probably been experiences in your life that you've learned from that inform you about how you typically interact with people. And so it's a reflective way to look at that and say, you know, am I carrying anger or frustration from my past experiences into this partnership that I'm trying to build right now? And looking at that and trying to let go of that or move past that. And then the, my second part of the question has to do with age and how that reflects in how people uh, interact with one another as far as ma white males, uh, both white males and, and women who are interacting with those white males. Mm -hmm. Age is a huge diversity issue today in the workplace based on my experiences in that a lot of our mindsets and leaders' mindsets from an older generation of what looks productive isn't what they're seeing a lot of younger folks exhibiting. Um, a lot of younger folks can multitask. You might see iPods and headphones on and yet as one fo leader from Georgia Power said, it doesn't look like they're working at all, but man, they're the most productive group I ever have. So it's a getting out of the box of what we think of is productive or effective relationship. It's we're sort of relearning another culture. It's a cross-cultural generational difference. And these issues that we've been talking about are layered in there as well. Thank you. I wanted to mention that, uh, Dr. Welp, that you have a number of booklets, uh, and I'm just going to show one here. Uh, this one is called Diversity Partnership Tips for White Women and People of Color Engage, uh, and we have a lot of other ones here. Uh, and so this is part of the work when you do it. I assume that they read these or get them in advance. And, and for people in our audience who would be interested in, in your work, I, I'm again going to repeat and have to put up the website that you have, and it's www wmfdp.com and that stands for um, white men as full diversity partners and I, I'm sure your work is there on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, explain a little bit to us how you do use the booklets uh, in your training. Um, and, and, uh, I mean, I say, and do they read these in advance of your coming to the yeah, site? Yeah, some of our programs they read them in advance. A lot of our programs um, are, 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 um, they have their own materials. These books we recently wrote about a year ago to help our material. A lot of people asked, we don't have time to engage in a deeper relationship with you, um, but we need your perspective. So we wrote these to reach a broader audience. So they're actually self-facilitating. Um, There's a lot of reflective questions. There's exercises in them that you can do with as an individual or as a group. Um, and there's been some organizations that have used those. Monotma County of Portland, Oregon um, has been using them with a majority of their managers and supervisors and it's complemented with some workshop experiences that complement them, but mostly they've been using them as resource guides. And although this, these programs are emphasizing uh, white men and their culture, and as you've indicated on, on the show, particularly last week, that oftentimes white men kind of feel left out of the discussion of diversity because the emphasis has been, as you said, on uh, women or on um, race issues of people of color or uh, gays and lesbians, bisexuals in that category. Um, in your work, do you find there's some major differences between the amount of information that white men have their culture and, and men of color? Uh, or is it, do men of color understand more or, or in this diversity program has it been given more attention and therefore uh, is, is there work to be done in that area also to, you know, again, bridging understanding across mm -hmm. these lines? 
Well, it's, there's a lot of organizations that have fewer men of color. Right. So that's missing a lot in, in organizations. And uh, everybody has work to do around how to partner with others. And so we help white men partner with other white men and uh, with women and people of color. And we help um, men of color, for example, as, as with white women, look at their assumptions about partnering with others, including with white men, and what assumptions do they carry in past experiences. And it's holding everybody accountable for learning and exhibiting a core set of leadership skills. That w the subject of the other book, which is, you know, am I showing courage? Am I connecting head and heart in the way I engage others? Am I tolerating ambiguity and turbulence? Am I having the ability to step up and have difficult conversations? Those kinds of skills everybody needs to learn, regardless of who you are. Janelle Burke. Last week we talked some about, as in, Tony indicated earlier, we talked some about the whole matter of feeling left out, uh, reverse discrimination, um, discrimination is uh, largely talked about in terms of gender or race or other issues, but that men sometimes feel left out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some people would say men are privileged. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about privilege, the privilege of being a white male in our culture? Sure. You know, that's an example of complexity. We are left out and privileged at the same time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and another example of complexity is that you know, I have uh, privileges, um, and at the same time, I work hard for a lot of what I earn. A lot of white men think of it as an either-or, and they don't see privilege because they think, I've worked hard to earn everything. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, we have worked very hard for a lot of things in life, and just by being white, I have uh, different, you know, I get to have Band-Aids that match my skin. I, ha I can walk into an organization, ask to talk to the leader, usually see somebody in my own race that might make me more comfortable and I'm not followed around shopping or stopped driving around town by the police near as much as po people of color and uh, there's male privilege I feel a lot safer jogging at night than a lot of women do heterosexual privilege you know pick picture of my loved ones on my desk not worry about what other people are gonna think of me and so that doesn't mean that something's wrong with me um, or I'm broken somehow. I just, that's the, how, you know, I'm a card carrying member of these different groups. And so I get to have these things, even though I didn't really earn them. And at the same time, I've earned a lot in my life. Now, if I've ever never looked at that experience of how my experience is different than Janelle's based on our gender, then um, not only do I not know about that, but I don't know that I don't know about that. And that makes it hard to partner with others in the workplace because you kind of get frustrated and you're like, you just don't get it. And I'm like, well, what is it I don't get? And so it's about looking at what is it unique about being white and male or heterosexual for those of us heterosexual and starting to look at that and accept that and not mean that it's some my fault somehow. I like to, the other paradox we talk about is it's not my fault. I'm not responsible for something that happened 300 years ago, slavery, for instance. And at the same time, I'm responsible for how differences play out today in terms of a level playing field or unlevel playing field. I would think that uh, from your work and when you have a group that's really uh, interested and you have time with them, that one of the growths out of this whole process would be that, and you've mentioned several times for white men having choices after they mm -hmm. understand the process, I would assume that from that they would it's almost a great relief that they can, by having the knowledge, then they can make those choices. And maybe some things they don't want to continue that's been a burden to them, and other things they certainly do want to continue. Mm -hmm. I've seen um, white men go home and change their relationship to their sons and daughters and have a more connecting relationship and, um, or choose to listen to their spouse a lot more as opposed to what I think is a good white male, I'm supposed to fix things. So I don't know if you ever give your spouse feedback or, you know, I don't want you to, I don't want you to fix this. I just want you to listen. So it's, it's really uh, becoming more choiceful in a way that's, I'm not an automatic pilot as much as I was. Mm -hmm. And this helps me. 
I see liberation in this a lot for mm -hmm. men. I've talked to a few young men uh, at the college level that said to me that they have a very connecting relationship with their mother, and they have wonderful fathers, mm -hmm. but because of the cultural uh, characteristic there that I've had them say to me that they're 18 or 20, said my father's never told me he loved me. Mm -hmm. And so with some of this, maybe that, uh, can, as you already said, can make uh, a much different relationship with their children. Mm -hmm. Sure, definitely. The other issue I want to get into, I made a few notes here earlier today, and uh, we have a lot of different environments that we're in and work in. Some people work in corporations, and some people work in uh, schools, K through 12 or higher education. Others work in local, state, or national government. Some are in the military. Some work in religious organizations. Do you see differences in the role of white men depending on where they spend most of their working years within those differences? Uh, depending on where their occupation is? Well, I see difference in sameness, <laughs> that paradox, okay. you know. So there's the same thread of white male culture in most of my experience of, uh, of, of a lot of us. And, yeah, a nonprofit organization, you're going you're gonna to be focused on tighter resources, trying to manage that, a more mission-driven, passion-driven, and the white men in there reflect that. And so um, it, it's a little bit varied, but underneath I see the same patterns of the same challenges of people partnering together. And the, the biggest point I think that is common is do white men challenge each other and interrupt things that aren't appropriate? Say, for instance, things that are happening around sexual harassment. Or is it always a woman or a person of color that needs to intervene? And so one of the things I look for is what kinds of challenge and support is happening amongst the white men. We worked, for instance, in a hydroelectric project with most overwhelmingly white men. And over several years, they were willing to challenge their colleagues around inappropriate actions that they did with women and people of color. And they really um, changed their culture through that process. I would assume much faster, and it would be more uh, a relief for people of color or women if it in that environment if the men are the ones that uh -huh. also from within making some corrections right and if you think back to the original sort of framing of diversity it's always focused on women and people of color and other groups so white men don't typically see their role and how critical it is to step up and engage each other and not with a two by four but with compassion to right. challenge and support each other method and approach right Janelle Burke. We're going to have some listeners out here there that are going to be saying, well, what is the white male culture? Last time you indicated that there were six themes that you found. And without going through the six themes individually, can you just kind of generally describe what that white male culture is about? Well, they might think of what is American culture and mainstream American culture. A lot of books that you read about here's American culture they actually, what they're naming, in my view, is white male culture. Because they'll say, here's American culture, and they'll say, here's Asian, or here's Latino, or African American. And they're not naming American culture as what I think of as white male culture. That, you know, the rugged sense that I can go out and action orientation, be more in my head than in my heart, great problem-solving skills. That, those kinds of tenets, I think, are, are core elements of both mainstream American and, and a white male culture. And, and can you explain what might be the difference between blue-collar and white-collar white males? Well... Or is there a difference? I think there's difference in sameness there <laughs> again. Again, we're yes. more of the complexity, but it's, there's, uh, there's an experience on an economic class system or social class different that gives folks a different kind of experience. I'd say all those tenets that I just listed off and we did last week are still in all white men in my view most most white men they play out differently sometimes it's harder for blue collar white men to see their privilege because they see more of the struggle they've made around a class challenge than it is for white collar men and again it's again accepting for them a both and that yeah i've got i've made i've worked hard for everything i've done in my life and i've had these pieces by having white skin or being a male that um, make things in life that I don't have to deal with. Nobody ever looks at me and says, I got my job because of affirmative action. 
and if if uh, I'm working with Tony and Tony performs poorly in his job, it doesn't reflect on me. I'm just another individual white male. Versus Janelle, if you perform, if a colleague of yours, another woman, performs poorly, it, people look at them and say, "Well, women aren't just qualified. They're not qualified." So it reflects on you. But there's so there's pieces like that that are um, part of having privileges. There's stuff I don't have to deal with that other people have to deal with. Quite often on this program, when people in different fields like yourself, we, a question we've asked so many times over the 34 years from all this work, <laughs> could you share with us one of your greatest uh, excitements and enjoyments and fulfillments from uh, the work you've done at this point? A, a, a humanistic story that's very um, helpful to you in your work. Well, I love seeing people um, transform themselves. We do a lot of work these days with teams of people from corporations and other companies where they come with intact, either an intact team or their partners and they learn things they never realized about each other and they really find um, that if they really take the time and practice having deeper kinds of partnership conversations, it can just, you know, really help them be more freer, less fearful, and they can actually get a lot more work done and they don't have to spend as much energy worrying about things and they accept their own humanness and the humanness of their colleagues and they get into supporting each other's learning and that that's really freeing to watch that change and I assume that you get uh, emails or letters or phone calls that give you energy to continue on your work mm-hmm yeah every once in a while we hear or hear stories about somebody out there being courageous and stepping up and naming something that's been going on for a long time that nobody's intervened on and it, that gives me joy and kind of feeds me to feel like this is worth it. One of the enjoyments in education is former students oftentimes will uh, be in touch and talk about uh, mm -hmm. in a very wonderful way how education has changed their lives and they like to share those stories with you. Uh, Dr. Michael Welp, thank you for being with us these two weeks. It's been very informative, and I know our viewers are going to greatly appreciate it, and we have left them information if they'd like to be in touch with you. Again, good luck in your work, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Janelle. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed these two weeks as much as we've enjoyed bringing them to you with Dr. Michael Welp with his organization called White Men as Full Diversity Partners. Uh, next week, we'll be moving to yet another subject, as we do from week to week or every two or three weeks, then we'll be going to a topic we think you'll be interested in. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.